I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Luke, chapter 7. We're finishing today the series, Now Let Us Have a Little Talk with Jesus. We've uh, talked to Jesus about the issues of his day, and uh, interestingly, they're the same issues today, and we've learned from him. Today, we're going to ask this question, what does Jesus know, and when does he know it? Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 36. If you've got a Bible of your own, find it, because we'll be referring back here and there, but the words are up on the screen. Verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in the town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with the hair of her head, kissing them and anointing them with the fragrant oil. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, This man, if he were really a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who's touching him, that she's a sinner. Jesus replied to him. Now, Simon didn't say anything. He's thinking it. But Jesus answers him. Jesus replied to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he said, say it. A creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Since they could not pay it back, either one of them, he graciously forgave them both. So, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one he forgave more. You've judged correctly, he said to him. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she, with her tears, has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. God's word for us today. I want to talk to you today a little bit about situational awareness. Labor Day weekend 2007. We hadn't been here that long. We were invited to a party at the home of Rob and Gretchen Duffett. Rob's in heaven now. But he used to have these uh, Labor Day community parties for his neighborhood. He'd get a garage band to play. They'd show a movie. They had refreshments and upwards of 200 neighbors would come. He invited us to come though we didn't live anywhere near that neighborhood. And so, of course, we went. But Audra and I were coming from different directions that day, so we were driving separately. I got there first. And uh, I'm kind of shy, and I, I didn't know anybody but, but the Duffets, but I was trying to meet a few people and make a few connections. But I didn't see Audra anywhere. Finally, she's using a GPS, she gets to the street, parks her car, goes into the house, and unlike me, she's, she's very outgoing, and, and she instantly meets everybody, knows everybody. She's just having a ball, having a wonderful time. That's her nature. Finally, somebody sitting in the living room said, now, how do you, how, who do you know? How did you get invited to the party? And she explained, well, uh, the man who's hosting the party, the owner of the house, is a member of our church. And dead silence in the room. And somebody said, we didn't know that Bernie went to church. He's Jewish. <laughs> and Audrey realized in that moment that she had gone to the wrong party. 
The GPS said, you have arrived. You know how it does when you get onto the street, you have arrived. And there were cars everywhere and people were going in. So she went in and was having a marvelous time, but it was the wrong party. Now the host, Bernie, took it all in stride and took her out on the sidewalk and pointed out the Duffet's house. That's where you want to be. <laughs> Situational awareness. Do you have it? Jesus did. And as far as I can tell, Jesus never turned down an invitation to a party. If you were a very strictly religious Pharisee and you invited him, he'd go. If you were a tax collector and a sinner and you wanted to hang out with Jesus, he'd hang out with you too. That was the way he was. And so he's at the house of Simon the Pharisee. I don't think Simon really thought Jesus would say yes. I mean, do you ever invite somebody, you've got a party and you invite people you know aren't coming? So it's kind of a win-win. You, you made the gesture, but they're not there. I think that was Simon's attitude. When Jesus shows up, he doesn't do the common courtesies. He doesn't have a servant wash his feet. Your feet are dusty wearing those sandals on a dusty road. You'd always have a servant uh, washing feet. He didn't do that. He didn't uh, give the kiss. You'd greet a kiss on each cheek, perhaps. No kisses. And uh, it, always you would put a little dab of ointment or perfume uh, somewhere around the head just as a refreshment. He didn't do that. So I don't think he really thought Jesus was going to be there. But if he did show up, it would be as a curiosity. He had invited other people. And in those days, we, we find this strange. But a wealthy person would have a courtyard and the banquet would be out in the courtyard. And the people who weren't invited, the neighbors around, were welcome to walk in and line up around the wall and just observe like the red carpet at the Oscars. You're not at the Oscars, but you're seeing who is and who's wearing what and what they have to say. But nobody thought this woman would show up. This is the faux pas of the season. Who let her in? Because the Bible says she was a sinner in the town. Now, you know what that means. It's not said, but you know what it means. She is a prostitute. She's a harlot. She's led an impure life. And she's in the house of a Pharisee. It was unheard of. And then she goes right up to Jesus. And, and the scripture says he's reclining. They're all reclining at the table. And what you would do, you would lay down at the table. The table is almost on the floor. You'd lie down with your feet behind you. So this woman comes up behind Jesus and begins to weep and to wash his feet with her tears and dry his feet with her hair, long hair let down. That's kind of unheard of too. And then to anoint him. She takes an alabaster flask of costly ointment, breaks it open, and pours it out on him. Simon sees all of this and he thinks to himself, he doesn't say it out loud, but he thinks to himself, well, he's no prophet. Not that he ever thought he really was, but this proves it. His convictions are vindicated. He's not really a prophet. If he was a prophet, he would know who that woman is and what the way she lives, and he wouldn't let her anywhere near him. He's no religious leader. And then Jesus responds. He answers Simon's thoughts. Jesus is quite perceptive. He knows. He just knows. Look at the outline that's in your, list, in your program, the listening guy there. If you have our app, there are more notes there you could, could find. The question today, what does Jesus know and when does he know it? Number one, Jesus knows how we live our lives. He knows how we live our lives. Nothing is hidden from him. That's why uh, Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my thoughts. Try me. Find any deceitful way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Jesus knows. He knows all things. 
Somebody asked me yesterday, when did Jesus realize he was the son of God? He was the Messiah. Did he know it when he was the, the baby in the manger? And I don't think so. He's a baby in a manger. Jesus was a human being too. But somewhere along the way, he began to understand exactly who he was. We know nothing about Jesus' teenage years. There's only one reference to his childhood at all. And that's in Luke chapter 2, the end of the chapter, when he's 12 years of age. And he goes to the temple with his parents. And then they leave. They leave him there accidentally. And uh, when they realize he's not with them, they search. And then they go back and they find him right there talking to the religious leaders, the elders, asking them questions and giving them answers. And the scripture says these aged religious leaders were amazed at Jesus' answers. He asked good questions, but he had great answers too. And his parents are upset because they've been worrying. And they say, why did you put us through this? We've been hunting everywhere for you. And Jesus said, didn't you know that I had to be about my father's business? He knew then. What does Jesus know? He knows how we live. He knew that woman. He knew the kind of life she had lived. He knew she was immoral. That's a tough word to say these days. I mean, what's moral and what's immoral and who's to judge and all of that? Well, the Bible standards are still the same. And you and I are still called to sexual purity, just like in Bible times. You and I are still, as Christians, called to lead our lives a certain way. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Don't you know that your body is the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit? That you're not your own? You're bought with a price. Glorify God with your body. So flee sexual immorality. Like Joseph in the Old Testament, run from it. We're living in a day that says anything goes and however you want to live, it's all right. And God says, no, there are still standards. We are to be pure before marriage, and we are to be monogamous in marriage. That's a sacred covenant with God and with our mate. This woman hadn't lived that way. I don't know how she got into that lifestyle. I'm not going to throw a stone at her. Some people get into that lifestyle really through no conscious decision of their own. I mean, it just happens to them. Maybe she was traded in in uh, slavery. She didn't want it. She didn't grow up. She wasn't a, a precious 12-year-old girl thinking that's how she wanted to live her life. The world happens to us, and there she is. But Jesus knew. But here's the thing. He knew she was a sinner, and he forgave all of her sins. He forgave all of them. Now, maybe that's not your sin, but all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Whatever our sin, if we confess and turn from it, he is gracious and loving and forgives us of our sin. Uh, this is not the first time these two have met. They've already had an earlier encounter when Jesus sees her. I mean, that's why she's there. She's there to to say thank you for what he has done. And so when she uh, uh, washes his feet and anoints him and all of that, he reminds her at the end of the chapter, he says, your sins, you could translate it, your sins stand forgiven. They're still forgiven. Because it's possible that though she had heard Jesus originally say, I forgive you, and she went home feeling like a new woman, she's now having second thoughts about it, and the devil is reminding her of the way she used to live. See, Simon sees her the way she used to be. Jesus sees her as she is and as she can be. But Satan loves to remind us of our past. And so now she's wondering, am I really forgiven? So the chapter ends by Jesus saying, your sins are still forgiven. The record has been expunged. God looks at you as a beautiful, beautiful person, pure white in his sight.
Have your sins been forgiven? Now, they're not forgiven. Her sins aren't forgiven because of what she does, this anointing of oil and, and the washing and the crying and all of that. Her sins are forgiven because of confession and faith. That's also at the end of the chapter. Her faith has brought this about. You don't have to do anything to earn God's forgiveness. In fact, you, you can't do anything. But if you'll confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you. And if you'll receive it by faith, it will be yours. Jesus knows how we live. And maybe nobody else in the room knows, but you know, and God knows. But I'm here to tell you, regardless of what has happened in the past, he is willing to forgive you. So he knows how we live, but something else. He knows what we're thinking too. He knows what we're thinking. Augustine translated that line, Jesus replied to Simon. Uh, He translates it, Jesus answered Simon's thoughts. Now that might might not have been too hard in this case. I mean, you might could have done the same thing because we telegraph our feelings sometimes, don't we? I mean, it was written all over Simon's face. He sees this woman, and he's just filled with utter disdain for her. And it was, he was, his arms were crossed, and he's a scowl on his face, and there's a tisk tisk in uh, his very attitude. You, you could predict it, too. But Jesus, he knew his thoughts. What a sobering idea that is. And it ought to frighten us a little bit. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 4, Jesus is having another encounter with scribes and religious leaders. And uh, they're being critical of him. And in that verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 4, it says, And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, he knows what we're thinking. He knows what uh, Simon is setting himself up as judge and jury over this woman. Now, if Jesus knows that, What else does he know about our thinking? What else does he know? Turn to Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5. Our thoughts are a battleground of their own. Somebody has said that the, the, the... contest of this age the warfare of this age is in the minds of people chapter 5 verse 21 you have heard that it was said to our ancestors do not murder and whoever does murder will be subject to judgment but I tell you anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment skip down to verse 27 verse 27 You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And that changes the ball game altogether. Don't misunderstand the passage. I don't think Jesus is saying that to be angry equals murder or to have lustful thoughts equals equals adultery I think he's teaching us that one thing leads to another and so if you uh, if you allow anger to fester between you and somebody a family member a friend a co-worker and you let it fester and grow and grow it can lead to murder you lose control of it and it explodes and he's not saying that to have a lustful thought is the same as adultery, but one thing leads to another. I hear people say all the time, we didn't mean for this to happen. We didn't want this to happen. Well, there were many times in the whole process when you made a choice and you went further and further in your mind. And before long, the actual deed took place. No, I'd rather... I'd rather you be angry with me than kill me. We can get over the anger. We can work that out. But don't kill me. Then it's over. The thought leads to the action. And Jesus knows the thoughts. I wonder if Simon ever contemplated that. I mean, the woman was guilty of immorality. Maybe Simon had just been thinking it. If he only knew that Jesus knew what was on the inside of his heart. 
Jesus knows how we live. He knows how we think. He even knows why you came to church today and the way you worship, why you worship the way that you do. Everybody worships in different ways, a different way. This woman is there with urgency and deep conviction. She's there to offer worship and thanksgiving to Jesus for what he has done for her. And that's why you ought to be here, by the way. Not out of a sense of obligation. I, would, I hate to think that anybody's here because they just feel obligated to come. I mean, I'll take that if that's all we can get, you know, and I'll remind you of your obligation. But I would rather you wanted to be here as a way to show your gratitude for what Jesus has done for you. But, but everybody does it differently. And sometimes we're critical of each other because we worship in a different style. And what I love about First Baptist is we offer a little bit of everything so that eventually, if today in your style, next week will, or what have you. But let's not judge and make preferences, raise them to the level of biblical truth. This woman has had her many sins forgiven her. And the fact is, I don't know who's here with little sins forgiven. We've all sinned grievously. And so we need to worship. You might not do it the way the woman did it, but there are certain elements that ought to be true for each of us. Number one, she worshiped emotionally. This is, this is coming from deep in her soul. She is moved. That's why she's crying. You ought to feel it. It's not all cerebral. You ought to feel it, what Jesus has done for you. And her worship was demonstrative. Demonstrative. She cries. She washes his feet. She dries his feet. She's doing actions in her worship. And we do some of that, you know. We stand. We sit. Sometimes we kneel. Some people raise their hands. I know you don't, but, but somebody in the room is. And that's their way to demonstrate. Put your whole body into it. You know, don't just worship with your mind or just with your voice. Put, put your whole body into it. And her worship was substantial. Substantial. It cost her something. She takes this alabaster flask, and that was expensive in and of itself, and it's filled with costly ointment that cost something like a year and a half worth of wages for a common worker. That's a lot of money for anybody. Take your salary, uh, and, uh, and that's, that's what's in that alabaster flask. And she takes it, and she breaks open the neck and pours out the contents. Now, once you've broken it, I mean, it's open. You can't, you can't seal it again. you got to use it all in that moment. So you would save it for the most special of occasions. No telling how long she'd had that or what she originally intended to do with it when she got it. But now she knows what to do with it. It belongs to Jesus. And in your worship, give him the best that you have. Don't hold back anything because of all he's done for you. Jesus knows it all. He knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. He can divide right down the difference between the, the, the bone and the marrow, the soul. He, he sees it all. And I'm praying that my life and your life will be open before him. So we don't have any secrets. He's Lord of all. Let's pray. Would you bow with me, please? We're going to sing in a moment, and I'm going to stand right here at the front of the room. And if you're ready today to give your heart to Christ, I want you to get up and come and just tell me so. And we'll pray about it, and you can make that decision here today. Or maybe you've done it privately, but never publicly. You ought to take a stand. Come out of the shadows and let people know you're a believer too. Or if you're here and you want to be a part of our church and you're ready to present yourself, you step out, come to me, and we will welcome you today. Father, bless in these moments. Give courage to respond. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.